Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Precisionary webinar. Um, we are delighted to host Dr. Steve Fordall today, who is from the Department of Nutrition at UNC Greenboro. Um, so Dr. Fordall today is going to talk about the interactions between saturated fat, cytokines, and microglia in the ventral striatum. striatum. Dr. Fordall is going to highlight how pro-inflammatory cytokines alter, alter dopamine terminal function and how increasing dietary fat intake may actually enhance microglial activity. So that might change our perceptions of our diet and what we take in. Um, his lab's primary research interests are to examine how the excessive intake of high fat or high sugar foods, which we all love, can alter brain function, leading to dysregulated food intake. And they're also interested in how prolonged consumption of a palatable <clears throat> diet degrades the perception of natural rewards by altering dopamine signaling in response to food. Um, Dr. Fordall's lab pairs a preclinical rodent model of obesity with electrochemistry, immunohistochemistry, and other biological endpoints with <clears throat> behavioral markers of dopamine system function. So with that, Steve, I want to hand you um, the microphone for your webinar talk, and thank you so much for being with us today. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. So, so as the introduction stated, uh, my lab particularly looks at saturated fat and dopamine neurochemistry, and kind of the work that we've done over the last couple of years has looked at the role of, of how pro-inflammatory cytokines may change dopamine neurotransmission. So I'm going to share some data that sort of led us to that path, and then also some of our, our more recent data that that may link uh, some of the microglial inflammatory cells in the brain um, to possibly play a role or how they may possibly contribute to some of the dysfunction. So our lab's general interests are how dietary fat can change brain chemistry. And really it's, uh, it, we focus specifically on how the type of dietary fat, not just dietary fat in general, um, and then how that changing brain chemistry can affect um, our food intake patterns, can affect food choice, can affect uh, satiety signals and things of that nature. So why dietary fat? Um, according to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, the most recent DGAs that came out, um, Americans uh, exceed our requirements for a number of nutrients. Sodium is, is by far the number one, um, but two caloric containing uh, nutritive components, added sugar and saturated fat, about 60% of Americans consume or exceed requirements for added sugars. And with saturated fat, about 70% of Americans, or 76% of males, 71% uh, of females exceed the requirements for saturated fat. So these are two nutrients that are critical um, or basically contribute uh, overwhelmingly to a, the incidence of overweight and obesity. Uh, but we focus on saturated fat because it, it's it seems to be a little bit more pressing with more of the uh, adult population exceeding the requirements for it. Um, also, saturated fat has been linked uh, directly with the increase in BMI, uh, it contributes to the obesity epidemic, um, also central adiposity, which uh, is known to be pro-inflammatory. And there's this history of saturated fat being a link, a pro-inflammatory uh, link in and of itself, uh, and just with the chronic low-grade inflammation associated with, with metabolic syndrome and, and overweight and adiposity. But there are also direct links with all of those in dopamine neurotransmitter systems. Um, so that's where our interests sort of, uh, sort of mend together as far as the saturated fat and dopamine neurotransmission. So a little background, a little history on that. Um, with obesity and dopamine, there are clinical reports, uh, sort of the hallmark finding to this is that there's a reduction in, in dopamine receptor, uh, D2 specifically receptors uh, with those that have, uh, Bit or with individuals that have developed obesity. Uh, if you look here on the picture on the right, this is a PET scan. Um, and here what you're looking at is uh, in the, the very center, that bright red that you see on the normal weight individual, that's an indicative of very dense dopamine D2 receptor binding. And you can see in the obese individual, 
um, you still have a little bit of that darker red development, but it's degraded quite a bit compared to the normal, normal way. Now, this is similar to, to substance use disorders because um, you see the same sort of lack of, of high density D2 receptor binding in individuals that, uh, that use cocaine, also other substance use disorders like opiates and also alcohol, uh, alcohol use disorders. Now, I'm not gonna say that obesity is on the same level as, as illicit drug use, um, but this does show that OBC sort of engages the same um, dopaminergic pathways that may contribute to some of the development and some of the behavioral aspects um, that we may see with uh, individuals with obesity. Now, there's also a reduction in activation in dopamine-rich brain regions. So another study that used uh, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging um, looked at the areas of the brain that lit up in response to consuming a milkshake. So they had individuals in a scanner, um, they gave them a sip of milkshake and they looked at a dopamine rich region of the brain and the ventral striatum. Um, and by looking or by tracking bold activation in that region, they can see um, how that region lights up in response to that, to that milkshake. So this particular study looked at baseline and then followed up with individuals six months later. And what they found was that individuals that lost weight or had stable weight at the six month mark actually saw an increase in dopamine uh, bold activation in that particular region of the brain. However, individuals that gained weight saw a significant reduction in the amount of dopamine released to that same milkshake that they consumed six months earlier. So there's a reduction in activation to extremely palatable foods um, over a period of time. Now, a follow-up study to that actually showed that this decrease in dopamine response to this particular milkshake actually predicted future weight gain. So there seems to be something with this, this degradation in the dopaminergic response or dopamine activation that possibly makes individuals a little more susceptible to either further developing obesity or that may make them prone to, to weight gain. So this is an extremely general hypothesis. Um, this is definitely uh, oversimplified, but the general hypothesis is that we consume a palatable food, something that we enjoy, something that um, causes a release of dopamine. So the first time we consume this food, that dopamine release, it's going to orient us to that food. It's going to help us consolidate that memory. Where were we when we had that food? What or the context cues around that food. So dopamine is definitely a learning molecule and it tunes us into um, these things that we may find valuable and may wanna seek out in the future. So after that first dopamine release or consuming that food for the first time, if we consume that food over and over and over again, the more we consume it, the less of a dopaminergic response that we're gonna to have to that. Um, and this is definitely an oversimplification of this. Um, there's a lot more that dopamine is doing, but this general hypothesis is that the more that we have this de degradation in dopamine release associated to this palatable, you know, previously pleasurable food, the more we may possibly overconsume it, um, leading to potential weight gain. So our lab is interested in, in finding out what exactly is causing, especially with saturated fat, the, that degradation of dopamine release. So our lab's uh, general approach is we use a preclinical model of diet-induced obesity. Um, so we use, uh, we use a preclinical model uh, with mice. And then we also use um, fast scan cyclical voltammetry, which is an electrochemistry technique that allows us to take uh, field recordings in brain slices um, where we can detect dopamine release and dopamine uptake rate. So with this, with the data that I'm gonna to share today is, is just our, our ex vivo slice work, um, but we can also do this in vivo um, as well. But basically with fast can cyclic voltammetry, we have a carbon fiber microelectrode. Um, we use brain slices 
Um, and then we can use an evoked action potential. So we can evoke uh, dopamine release with a small stimulation. And then that carbon fiber will basically oxidize and reduce dopamine and give us a concentration of dopamine that's released into the synapse. And then it also gives us a measure of how quickly that dopamine is cleared by the, the preterminal uh, or by the dopamine terminals. So this basically gives us dopamine kinetics um, and it, it allows us to, to sort of probe overall terminal function. Because it's ex vivo, you don't have the context cues and other things that help regulate, but you can get an idea of how certain compounds and certain pharmacology can change dopamine release and uptake rate. And it gives us a pretty good proxy of, of how the terminals may change with a long-term um, uh, manipulation like, like a, a dietary change. Now, we record primarily in the nucleus accumbens, which is in the ventral striatum, and that's sub subdivided into two different anatomical regions. There's the nucle nu nucleus accumbens core, and then also the nucleus accumbens shell. <clears throat> and we're interested in these regions mainly because of their, their role in motivation and reward, and also reward learning. So that's salience and, and um, there have long been implicated in reward pathways. So that's one of the reasons, but a lesser known uh, functional circuit that is contained within the nucleus accumbens is a satiety circuit back to the hypothalamus. So there's a satiety circuit that is a, it's a D1 activated circuit that goes back and sort of starts to trigger or is one of the cues that helps trigger satiety. So dopamine has a sort of uh, biphasic role in food intake. One, it helps us seek out food. So that's, you know, it's an orienting chemical. So if we're hungry, it'll help us try to find food. Um, it is also released with respect to palatable nutrients. Um, but then once those palatable nutrients and the energy from those nutrients are on board, um, dopamine can be released. And in this particular region, feeds back to the hypothalamus and will help uh, trigger satiety along with endocrine, endocrine cues from, um, from the, the, the body from circulating nutrients as well. So that's the, the part that our lab is, is most interested in is whether or not in this medial shell, medial core, dopamine release uh, is altered that could possibly affect the satiety circuit. So we do a lot of slice voltammetry <clears throat> with this work. And this particular picture, uh, we used the compressed tome and we've had it in the lab here for, for six years now. And I mean, it's sliced probably close to a thousand, a thousand different samples. So it's been, it's been a workhorse for us. <laughs> And this is actually a picture that's hot off the press here this week. This, these are uh, one of my grad students was doing probe placements. This actually is from our slice voltammetry, but, but we slice in a similar, similar manner for that work. Uh, but here we're looking at, uh, we have guide cannulas placed down into the accumbens and we're infusing different compounds and looking at food intake. So that may be for a, a seminar down the road. Um, but it gives you an idea of sort of what, what the uh, slices look like once we, once we slice them using the compressed tome embedded in agros, makes it really easy to manipulate, really easy to, to move around. And we slice it about 300 microns. Um, and then once we have these slices, we bathe them <clears throat> in artificial cerebral spinal fluids. They have access to nutrients. And then once, they, once uh, we have them sliced and uh, equilibrated, this is our slice voltammetry rig. And you can see here, right in the center of both of these dishes, there's a small little platform. And that platform has the oxygenated artificial cerebral spinal fluid flowing through it. And that's perfusing the, <clears throat> these slices continuously. So they always have oxygen, they always have nutrients, um, and they'll, they'll normalize uh, typically within 45 minutes or an hour. Um, and then we can start taking uh, baseline recordings. And you can usually record from a slice for a couple of hours depending on the type of experiment that you're running. Um, and then you can also see here Coming in from the right-hand side, we have our stimulating electrode. We place that down just barely on top of the slice. And then we have a recording carbon fiber coming in from the left. Um, and that's basically triangulating with the stimulator. 
<clears throat> and detecting dopamine release um, when we when we evoke an action potential. So our lab's early question, we are in a nutrition department, so we like to ask nutrition related questions when it comes to uh, and sort of using this neuroscience technique. Um, so there have been plenty of studies that had linked uh, obesity with changes in dopamine, had linked um, high fat diets with changes in dopamine. So our early question was, does fat type um, change dopamine neurotransmission? So is it just is it just the weight gain? Is it just the high fat diet in general? Or is there a difference between certain species of fat um, on how it changes dopamine neurotransmission? So our first question, we approach this using um, uh, just basically by manipulating the amount of fat that is in the diet and the species of fat. So our control, uh, basically 10% of kcals from fat. Now this is a control, but it's actually a low fat diet. Most rodent chows are about 14 to 16% fat. Um, so this is a little bit lower in fat. So it's a low fat versus a high fat diet. Um, but the high fat diet, this is primarily saturated fat. And this is probably the typical one that you've seen in historically in the literature where it's 60% of kcals primarily lard. <clears throat> so this is predominantly a saturated fat species. Um, but to control for that, we had uh, research diets make a nutrient matched 60% um, kcals from, from fat. Um, however, instead of using saturated fat, they use predominantly uh, flaxseed oil. So an omega-3 anti-inflammatory fatty acid to get at whether or not it's the saturated versus an unsaturated fat uh, with e whether or not either of them played a, a role or if, if it was just the total amount of fat in general. And then we used a blend, which was half flax and then also half uh, saturated fat. So, and these are all nutrient matched. So they're micronutrient matched. The only thing that we manipulated was the, the fatty acid uh, species um, between these diets. <clears throat> so taking a look, um, we fed these diets for, to the mice for a six week period. And you can look at just, just total daily food intake. And what you see here, it's not surprising that all of the saturated fat diets um, they consumed, or all of the high fat diets, regardless of saturated or unsaturated, consume more calories per day than the control. Um, the energy density of the diet is, is significantly greater. So this isn't a surprise at all. Uh, what was a surprise was that when we looked at body weight gain over that six week period, so you can look at baseline and then also at six weeks, that all of the animals consuming <clears throat> a diet high in fat significantly gained weight, but the flaxseed oil gained about 70% of the weight that the saturated fat did. So they're consuming about the same amount uh, calorie wise, but it didn't seem to have the same uh, impact on body weight. Um, and then also, as you'll see here in a second, same with just, uh, just the overall metabolic impact. So flax gained about 30% uh, less uh, weight percent weight gain over six weeks. And then the blend um, was sort of split the difference between the flax and the saturated fat. So that was an interesting early finding in this study. So next, just to do a little further uh, sort of snapshot metabolic phenotyping, we did uh, IP glucose tolerance tests. So doing this, basically you're challenging the animals with the bolus of glucose and then watching the rate of that glucose disappear over time. And the more metabolically impaired the animal is, um, the slower they'll clear that glucose. Um, and this is sort of a proxy for insulin resistance. Um, it's just an, it's an easy snapshot uh, phenotyping test to, to take. So here, we take blood glucose at fasting, then we give an IP dose two grams of, uh, of glucose per kilogram body weight. And you see the blood glucose shoots up. <clears throat> and then in the saturated fat group, it takes them significantly longer to clear that glucose compared to the metabolically uh, quote unquote healthy, um, low fat or, or control animals. So we do this also with the flaxseed uh, diet. <laughs> and they looked remarkably like the control mice. So it, they don't seem to have the same um, metabolic impairment as far as clearing blood glucose. <clears throat> so this has implications with 
uh, things like metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes, but they just seem to be metabolically um, a little more healthy, um, even though they're still consuming a large amount of calories, and it's still from dietary fat. Now, the, uh, the saturated fat, the blending, the saturated and omega-3 blend group looked a lot like the regular saturated fat. So it uh, didn't look too promising to have a blend of the two uh, species of, of fat with regard to this uh, one measure of metabolic phenotype. So now moving on to sort of our lab sweet spot, looking at the uh, characterizing dopamine in the nucleus accumbens or the NAC. Um, so here we're gonna look at dopamine release and we're gonna look at two different parameters of dopamine release. The first we're gonna show is here in our control group. Um, you can see that we have our stimulation that's occurring here. Um, and then you can see the evoked dopamine release. And this is just a single pulse stimulation. So we can use different stimulation parameters um, ba basically to probe different, uh, different aspects of the terminal function. So just a single pulse just gives us a basic, um, uh, a basic sort of quote unquote tonic dopamine release. In our control, saturated fat, flax, and our blended groups all relatively look very, very similar. So there's really no, there's no statistical significance between any, any of these with a single pulse uh, stimulation. However, when we use a five pulse 20 hertz stimulation, which mimics the physiological firing rate of a phasic dopamine burst. So when there's a dopamine burst related to like a physiological or a cue or anything like that, um, these neurons burst fire at 15 to 20 hertz. And when we look at five pulse um, in this physiological range, first there's significantly more dopamine that's, that's released in the synapse, but in our saturated fat group, there's still significantly more dopamine released, but significantly less compared to control. And then flax and blend, um, they mediated it a little bit, uh, but um, overall it's really the saturated fat group that had the, the, the most impairment of this single pulse to five pulse um, ratio. And if you look at the area under the curve, that's basically telling you how much dopamine is hanging out in those terminals for a, you know, between the, the one pulse and the five pulse. And this is basically a measure of sort of the dynamic capacity of these terminals, their ability to, to respond to like a phasic stimuli or, or something of that nature. And the saturated fat group has significantly blunted capacity um, to mount this big physiological burst. So that could um, play a role in engaging downstream circuits. Um, but the flax and, and blend group that had the, the unsaturated fatty acids, they approached an area under the curve that was a little more close to the control animals. So overall dopamine release, it seems that saturated fat dampens phasic release a little more so than the flax and blend compared to a low fat control. So next we look at uptake rate. Um, and this is a proxy of the dopamine transporter function. So this helps shape dopamine in the synapse, um, which helps uh, trigger uh, D, D1 um, stimulated downstream circuits. But basically what we see is that the saturated fat, we see a significant slow slowing of the Vmax to clear uh, dopamine from the synapse. And that's uh, not seen in the flax, um, but it is also seen in the blend. So there seems to be an uh, interaction between the saturated fat slowing uptake rate. And that may be a compensatory response because they're not clear or they're not um, evoking as much for the five pulse. Maybe they're slowing clearance to allow more dopamine to be in the synapse. I'm not exactly sure. We haven't chased that down quite yet. But this first early study basically showed that type of fat does matter. <laughs> Um, a diet high in saturated fat uh, that promotes body weight gain, impairs blood glucose regulation, and uh, just metabolic phenotype, um, similar to a metabolic disorder. Uh, it also just attenuates phasic dopamine release <clears throat> and uptake rate. And by and large, a, a diet with the same amount of calories from fat, but from an unsaturated spe species, um, pretty much normalized a lot of these uh, closer to control. So it didn't completely wipe it out, but they didn't seem to show the same um, level of impairment as a saturated fat group. 
So we're sort of brainstorming this and, and the obvious question to us is the pro and anti-inflammatory nature of these fatty acid species. So <clears throat> what's the impact of inflammation? So does, does chronic or acute inflammation caused by either diet induced obesity or saturated fats, does that impact dopamine neurotransmission? And could that possibly explain some of these changes that we see uh, with the high fat diet, the high saturated fat diet? So with, you know, diet induced saturated fat and inflammation, it's well established that diet induced obesity is associated with this chronic low grade systemic inflammation, which is mediated by uh, this white adipose tissue, uh, the rapid expansion of white adipose tissue, um, causing cells to not receive nutrients and uh, causing these crown light structures. And uh, you have these, these macrophages infiltrate and try to clean up and, and reorganize and restructure those cells. And they do that by re releasing some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines to clean up the waste. If this happens on a large scale, that can um, possibly uh, increase a little bit of, of these inflammatory cytokines in circulation and, and, and damage neighboring tissues. So there's this chronic low-grade inflammation that's associated um, in adipose tissue with uh, diet-induced obesity. Regarding the brain, um, there is a link between <clears throat> these dietary lipids, either from lipoprotein delivery from the diet or through non-esterified fatty acids being released from, from adipocytes, some of these fats can, uh, in the brain actually can activate microglia. These microglia have a host of receptors and there's one particular receptor, the toll-like receptor, that saturated fatty acids are actually a ligand for. So they can bind to this toll-like receptor and activate some of these pro-inflammatory or cause these microglia to become active and release inflammatory cytokines of their own. So this could be due to diet, this could be due to um, obesity and insulin resistance causing increased lipolysis um, uh, in some of that white adipose or that fat tissue, increasing the amount of, of fatty acids in the blood um, and possibly triggering a little more of this in the brain. So the, in order to, to sort of get at whether or not uh, neuroinflammation is possibly uh, triggering any of the uh, changes that we see, our next questions were, we know that the 60% of uh, saturated fat from the diet causes these changes in dopamine, but what's the threshold? 60% is the whopping amount of saturated fat. So if we back that off a little bit, do we still see, or is there a dose effect of saturated fat on dopamine neurotransmission? Also, do these inflammatory cytokines change dopamine regulation at the accumbens terminals? And then what role do microglia play in this, in this whole process? So those questions moving forward, we use our same model, diet-induced obesity. So we're using mice. Uh, we actually uh, model, and I didn't mention this earlier, but we model um, sort of the transition between adolescence into early adulthood. So we bring mice in at six weeks old um, and feed them the high-fat diet as they transition into, into adults. Um, so we bring them in at six weeks old, we feed them for six weeks. Um, this particular study, we use three different uh, percent uh, saturated fat diets. So the first one is the control, the same that we used in the last one, the low fat 10%. Then we have the same high fat 60, but we also have a high fat 30. So this sort of splits the difference. Um, it's definitely a reasonable amount of saturated fat, and it's definitely within reason as far as being uh, translationally relevant to, um, to what the American population consumes. So we feed that for a six week period of time, then we do our metabolic phenotyping. Um, after this, we have some animals that will uh, just go to tissue expression for, for cytokines and look at tissue cytokine levels and gene expression. Um, we also have animals that go to immunohistochemistry to look at microglial markers um, and activation. And then there are other animals that will go and be sliced uh, and have brains removed and sliced for ex vivo voltammetry. And then we can use manipulations like adding cytokines or pro or anti-inflammatory treatments to, to see if they change things. <clears throat> 
And I'll talk about some of those treatments here in a little bit, because um, we use some mini pumps and other things that I'll, I'll mention here in a second. <clears throat> so with this model, sort of using the same layout as I had in the previous, when you look at percent weight gain, not surprisingly, the high fat 60 diet in both males and females causes a significant amount of, of weight gain. Um, but that high fat 30, there was a small increase in, in body mass, um, but really not significant. So they, they didn't gain weight, but not significantly elevated from the low fat um, animals. So they don't gain nearly as much weight as the high fat 60 mice do. When we look at fasting blood glucose, also, the in males and in females, <clears throat> that intermediate high fat 30 group looked very, very similar um, to the low fat animals, but that high fat six, 60 group was significantly elevated as far as fasting blood glucose. And then in our IP glucose tolerance test, here I'm just going to show area under the curve. This is basically just the, uh, the glucose clearance rate. <laughs> But here, so their fasting blood glucose in the high fat 30 was the same. But here, you do see an impairment in the high fat 30 in both males and females, where they don't clear blood glucose quite as, as uh, efficiently as a low fat. They're nothing compared to the high fat 60, but in absence of gaining excess body weight and having fasting blood glucose, you do start to see a little bit of metabolic impairment when it comes to blood glucose regulation. <laughs> So it's sort of kind of splitting the difference and it may be a little more translationally relevant uh, amount of, of saturated fat. So then looking at the amount of saturated fat and its effect on uh, dopamine, first we're gonna look at evoked uh, release and uptake rate in the nucleus accumbens. So looking at single pulse release, now here, um, I actually have males and females combined in this. We, uh, this particular paper we report, um, we do a, all the sex comparisons and there was no significant difference between any sex comparisons on any of the parameters. So we, we collapsed it. But in the paper we report in the supplemental data, uh, all of that separated as well, if you're interested in, in that. So here, we, we don't see a difference between the high fat 60 and the low fat as far as our single pulse. So this is that tonic level. And this is historically where we usually don't see much of a difference. Uh, we did see a slight reduction or a, a significant reduction in the high fat 30 group, but this, this can sort of change back and forth. So I don't read too much into this. However, when it comes to our, our phasic dopamine release, our five pulse 20 hertz, um, here we see a significant reduction in both the high fat 60 and the high fat 30. So this is that phasic capacity to release uh, a burst fire of dopamine um, in response to like a salient cue or stimuli. So here, both the high fat 30 and the high fat 60 degrade the terminal's capacity uh, to release a large amount or as much dopamine as the low fat controls uh, under these stimulation parameters. And we also see a reduction in the rate of dopamine clearance. And here's more of a dose response effect where the higher we increase the saturated fat, the lower um, or the slower the maximal rate of dopamine clearance uh, becomes. So all of this was collected in, in the um, mo mostly in the ventral, ventral medial uh, nucleus accumbens core. So there does seem to be a threshold of saturated fat that initiates the terminal changes in dopamine release and uptake rate, um, particularly on Vmax. So the next question was, uh, do these inflammatory cytokines change dopamine regulation um, at the terminal? So if we challenge them with cytokines, uh, what's, what's gonna happen? So first, we used exogenous interleukin-6, which is a, a pro-inflammatory cytokine, uh, very extensively studied, both sy systemically and uh, to a little less, lesser extent the brain. Um, however, when we're doing our, our voltammetry slice experiments, we collect our baseline data, and then we will continue after we do our simulation parameters, we'll reestablish baseline. Um, so here you're seeing just stable baseline in these first couple of collections. 
and then we'll bathe over five nanomole IL-6. We just wash that into the ACSF. Um, and here we wash it on for a 30 minute period. And then we just remove, re remove that and just go through a washout period with just regular ACSF again. And here you can see this five nanomole of IL-6 um, with respect to dopamine release didn't really do anything at all. So it didn't change in any of the low fat, high fat 30 or high fat 60. Um, it, it marginally affected things, but didn't really change um, anything. So next we used uh, just a, a higher dose of this. So using 10 nanomole of IL-6, you can see that during the washout, there's some variability of whether or not it increases or decreases dopamine release. And then in washout, you can see that it significantly re reduced dopamine released uh, exclusively in the high fat 60 animals. So the high fat 30, it, it did reduce, but they sort of recovered um, when we entered into the washout period. But a reduction in dopamine release in the high fat 60 was, um, was, or the high fat 60 group was significantly lower when exposed to this higher concentration of IL-6. So we also wanted to look at a few other cytokines. So next we looked at TNF-alpha. And here, same thing, when we used our smaller dose of TNF-alpha, um, we wash it on for 30 minutes, and then we collect for another uh, 30 minutes in a washout period. We didn't see any effects. When we increase that dose um, to 300 nanomol, then we do see an effect exclusively in the high fat 60 animals. So there is a significant reduction in dopamine release when they're challenged with these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, so uh, actually, interestingly enough, uh, we didn't see any effect of either of those uh, IL-6 or TNF-alpha on VMAX. So uh, us thinking that, that, that the uh, chronic low-grade inflammation may be changing VMAX or uptake rate um, didn't seem to hold true at all. We only saw an effect on them decreasing the amount of dopamine release. So that's a, it's an important thing to note. So here, um, to sort of get at this a little bit further and to go through a couple of different uh, types of control experiments, um, I'm actually showing you the exact same data as I did in the last slide. I'm just showing it in a little different uh, presentation. But here we have our higher dose or a 10 nanomole of IL-6. We have our exposure window for 30 minutes and then our washout for 30 minutes. And you see the low fat, the high fat six or 30 and the high fat 60. And you see that reduction in this high fat 60 group. But we did a few different controls for inflammation. So our first set of controls, and then actually before we get there, I'm also going to remind you about the five pulse dopamine baseline release data. Um, but in our first set of controls, we wanted to see if, if it is indeed just the inflammation. Is it the inflammation or is it the fat that's causing um, this reduction in dopamine release? So to do this, we used these osmotic mini pumps um, where you can implant these mini pumps. You can load them with different pharma pharmacological compounds. You can implant them underneath the skin in these animals and they'll release the compound um, over, you know, uh, in this particular study, we used them over a, a 20 day uh, exposure. So here, um, basically we have our low fat animals that either had mini pumps lo uh, loaded with saline or many pumps loaded with lipopolysaccharide, 300 micrograms per kilogram per day. So this is that pro-inflammatory um, compound uh, of uh, bacteria in the gut that can be released. Um, very pro, I mean, they'll trigger uh, microglia, they'll trigger macrophages, they trigger a pretty robust immune response. But this is a low dose simulating chronic systemic inflammation because it's gonna be underneath the, uh, the skin on the body or just right between the scapula of the mice. And you can see the low fat animals that had this LPS mini pump, they looked very, very similar when we challenged them with IL-6 to the high fat 60 group. So they had the same reduction 
um, approximately 20-ish percent um, in dopamine release when they were challenged with exogenous cytokines. So there may be this priming effect on these microglia with this high fat 60 group or this priming with lipopolysaccharide. So then we wanted to ask the question whether or not we could block this using an anti-inflammatory treatment. So our first pass was just to use ketophen. So ketophen is just a, um, basically an inflammatory control. It's something we use post-op for surgeries uh, to control inflammation. And here, instead of using a uh, mini pump, we just did acute uh, sub-Q uh, ketophen dosing. So we have our low fat group that we just dosed with saline instead of ketophen. Then we have our low fat ketophen that we dosed for three days with three milligrams per kilogram per day for three days prior to, to decap and brain removal for voltammetry. And then we did the same with the high fat 60 group where they got saline or ketophen. In the low fat saline, they look a lot like our low fat um, normal animals. So that's sort of what replicates our previous findings. Our low fat ketophen didn't really change much at all. Our high fat with saline, we see that same reduction in dopamine release. So that replicates our previous finding in, in the previous cohort of animals with the high fat 60. And then the animals that receive ketophen that also were on that high fat 60 diet, we do see a small attenuation in how they respond to these inflammatory cytokines. So it does lead us to believe that there may be this, this priming of, of these inflammatory cells. Um, and then if you treat with an anti-inflammatory, that can temper this a little bit. So it leads us to believe that um, the inflammation is playing a role in possibly priming um, how the terminals respond to exogenous cytokines. So another thing I do wanna show is that all of these treatments, both the lipopolysaccharide and the ketophen, didn't change baseline dopamine release parameters at all. So it doesn't appear that these pro or anti-inflammatories change the capacity of the terminals to release dopamine, but they do change how the terminals respond when they're challenged. That's sort of what we're summarizing to this point. So that's all modeling this chronic inflammation similar to diet-induced obesity. So our next question was to ask whether or not acute inflammation also does this. So here we used IPLPS to mix per keg um, four hours before decap. And acute LPS, when looking at dopamine release, does decrease dopamine release both in, in low fat and high fat animals, um, significantly slows dopamine uptake rate in the low fat animals. Um, also lowers it in high fat. And then bath application of LPS um, use, using voltammetry, so during our, our slice experiments, um, basically does the same thing, releases do or decreases dopamine release um, and slows Vmax. So it sort of looks like acute inflammation or an acute assault um, probably causes a reduction in Vmax, but this chronic uh, low-grade inflammation probably changes how the terminals respond to, to this acute uh, inflammation. So some of our key takeaways. One, the chronic inflammation sort of primes the nucleus accumbens to respond to exogenous cytokines. The acute inflammation sort of dampens dopamine release and uptake kinetics. Um, but our saturated fat model of diet-induced obesity probably more closely resembles chronic inflammation um, than, than this acute. Uh, and, and there seems to be sort of a graded effect on the amount of fat changing terminal kinetics, but really more saturated fat really primes the terminals to respond more to these exogenous cytokines. So if you think of this translationally, this would be you know, uh, an individual that consumes a lot of saturated fat, um, possibly being more susceptible to an insult like a stroke or, or something of that nature. So our last question would be, do these microglia play a role in this process? So the inflammatory cells in the brain <clears throat> or the immune cells that <clears throat> can produce some of these inflammatory cytokines, are they primed and, and actively responding um, under these conditions? So to do this, we used immune histochemistry 
So here we're looking at uh, both males and females. And just to sort of characterize this a little bit, first we looked at tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the, the rate limiting enzyme for dopamine uh, synthesis. So it basically just allows us to identify dopamine terminals. And here you can see the on the, the right hand side, um, our left, the low fat is on the left, high fat 30 in the center and high fat 60 on the right. And there was a significant increase in tyrosine hydroxylase um, fluorescence in our high fat 60 group and a dose effect in females that we didn't see in males. But the interesting thing here was in our high fat males, we had really, really dense arborization, but they were much more sparse compared to the low fat and high fat 30. So where they were, they were really, really pronounced, but they weren't as evenly uh, spread throughout, throughout the region. So that was an interesting finding in and of itself. Next, we looked at CD11B, which is a marker for microglia. And we see a significant increase in our high fat 60 animals, and then also a dose dependent increase in, uh, fem in females with the high fat 30 and high fat 60. And we can see that these uh, sort of co-localize with our dopamine terminals, but you can see an increase in, in our microglia, um, specifically in our high fat 60 uh, group. And next we use a marker of microglial activity, this IBA1. So this is a marker once they've been triggered uh, uh, to release pro-inflammatory cytokines. And we see a significant increase in the high fat 60 animals. Um, and same thing in females, we see this dose effect with the 30 and 60. Um, so this does suggest that this high fat diet is priming these microglial cells. Um, and possibly when we're washing on these additional cytokines, it may be further priming them to have an effect on, on these dopamine terminals on regulating dopamine release and reuptake. And what's also interesting is that some of these, um, these microglia also have dopamine receptors on them. So there's some crosstalk between these dopamine neurons and microglia that, um, that could be pretty interesting, um, pretty, pretty fascinating to go down. Um, so then we also just did a marker of co-localization just to look at the percent of these microglia that are activated. And we see a significant increase in the high fat 60 animals in both males and females with this co-localization or the amount of microglia that have this IBA1 um, marker active in them. So there's an increase in, in activation in, this, uh, in these glial cells. So our overall general conclusions is the, there is a dose effect of saturated fat on dopamine in the accumbens. Likely it's probably not caused by chronic inflammation, although that may be making it more responsive to pro-inflammatory cytokines. So the chronic inflammation may not be causing the characteristic changes at baseline, but it does cause them to respond differently. Um, and there is an effect of saturated fat on glial activation. It does prime these microglia and cause them uh, greater activation, uh, possibly by this activating of this toll-like receptor by non-esterified fatty acids or saturated fatty acids. But I really think the timing is key here. It's important to, to note that with these in inflammatory insults, we're looking at this without stimulating them in any way. It's, it's hard to, to really figure out exactly the temporal dynamics. Um, if you time this after a meal because saturated fat, just the, the rate of absorption and how it's delivered, um, it's sort of a, a tricky thing to time. So we're trying to, to get our timing down to find the best um, dynamics as far as getting a read on whether or not it's saturated fat from the diet or just lipolytic activity from uh, adipocytes releasing some of these saturated fats. So that's something that we're still kind of uh, is is uh, something we're trying to figure out. So our next steps, we wanna look at treatment, can we reverse this high fat to low fat? Um, does it have an effect on satiety? Uh, that's what one of my graduate students is working on right now um, from some of those brain slices that you saw earlier. Um, and also, if it's not chronic inflammation, maybe there's just this effect on these membrane lipids. Maybe this lipid composition is what's changing uh, the dynamics between you know, dopamine release and reuptake rate and maybe the expression of some of the transport, transporter dopamine receptors on, on these terminals. <laughs> 
So those are sort of some of the next steps. And then of course, I wanna acknowledge uh, uh, everyone in the lab that's, that's worked very, very hard over the last couple of years on this. Uh, my doctoral student, Heather Emmon, Emmons. Um, she's been uh, indispensable helping with voltammetry work and some of the, the newer satiety experiments. Um, Madison Loudermilk did uh, the lion's share of, of immunohistochemistry and also like to, to thank our funding sources, um, NIDDK. Well, Dr. Fordall, thank you so much for your talk. We actually already have one question. And if Dr. Wang doesn't mind, I'm gonna go ahead and ask it for you. He wanted to ask you more specifically about your protocol for slice testing, um, which was what was the section and thickness that you had used? And maybe you can talk to us a little bit about how you kept your slices really healthy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, we slice at 300 microns. So between three and 400, 300 actually, um, it, it, gives it, the, it gives the slice structure, enough structure for us to be able to lift it out and place it into the dish. Um, and with it being embedded in agros, um, it also provides a little, a little structure as well. Um, and as far as, as far as increasing viability, um, we slice, we actually slice just at room temperature. Uh, so we, uh, once we get the brain removed and blocked and, and in the compressed tome, we'll slice at room temperature and then we'll slowly bring them up to temp um, in the slice rig uh, or in the voltammetry rig. Uh, and that slow equilibration with uh, the ACSF providing nutrients and oxygen, um, it, it does a, a really, really nice job, but it does take a little, a little time for them to get happy. <laughs> Great. Um, and Dr. Wayne has some wonderful follow up questions. And actually, Dr. Wayne, if you want to unmute yourself, if you can, um, you can also enter in chat if you want to or not. Um, he has um, uh, more questions for you. Um, uh, Steve, did you want to unmute yourself? Am I not? I'm gonna go ahead and just keep it rolling. And so um, he says, it's a very nice talk. Um, Steve, thank you so much. Some questions, is there any special reason you chose a diet duration of six weeks for your studies? Yeah, um, honestly, the six weeks was just to bridge from adolescence into adulthood. So mm -hmm. initially, so initially being in a nutrition department, one of my first uh, questions was, diet, you know, uh, adolescent and childhood obesity. So this was a way for us to model that. We've also done studies where we've fed for 16 weeks um, with one of my collaborators, uh, Dr. Keith Erickson here at UNCG. So we've done longer exposures, um, but we start, I wanted to capture when we first start to see these changes. So after 16 weeks of exposure, they're there, they're really exaggerated, but this was the earliest time point where I started to see changes. And I thought that was developmentally um, uh, important. Great. Um, and a follow-up question for that is, you showed the weight gain after six weeks of feeding fat, the fat diet. And um, he's wondering if you notice any weight loss for some animals due to fatty liver or even cirrhosis. Yeah, um, actually, I think we catch them before they develop that. Uh, they definitely are starting to develop fatty liver for, for sure. Um, but we, we don't necessarily see weight loss. There are some, some animals that don't gain the same amount of weight. So there do seem to be some mice that are a little mm -hmm. resistant to mm -hmm. the excess body weight gain. And I think those are interesting. Once we have enough of them, we'll probably <laughs> do some analysis of them uh, by themselves. Um, but yeah, we, we typically don't see that um, at this early of a time point. Got it. And a few more questions because your talk is really fascinating and so relevant because the American Academy of Pediatrics just revised the childhood obesity approach for children, which is um, so relevant to your research. Um, another question is fasting glucose levels. Um, did you do overnight fasting or some other method? Yeah, this is overnight. So this is just a 12 hour fast. Um, so just an over, overnight fast. Yeah. And then with regards to the mini pump approach, is this mini pump um, usable for refilling drugs? No, this is, it's a, you can replace them. Um, okay. So if you needed to do a, a dose delivery for a longer period of time, you can remove them and replace them. 
um, you, they're basically just kind of stapled in under the skin and that's that's not too difficult. Um, but no, I timed mine to where they would go in and, and just finish their dosing at the end of um, the terminal endpoint. Great. Um, I have a question which is a little bit of a future application or um, older application um, of age. Um, you know, with the process of gastric bypass and other surgical approaches to um, obesity, um, and how does a process, and maybe it's been studied in animal models like your mouse animal model, if you could tell us, how does a process or surgical approach like gastric bypass um, affect the dopamine response? Oh my gosh. It's um, a very, a very broad question. I know. Yeah. No. And all of the resectioning of, of the GI, uh, we have all sorts of endocrine signals and just the, the gut brain axis that you're, you're disrupting a, a, a lot of those, um, you know, through vagal stimulation, uh, feeding up. I don't know exactly what that literature says, but I would say that you're probably significantly changing, um, how the brain's going to respond to things. Oh, wonderful. Um, so I do want to wrap up, but want to ask if any of our other attendees have any more questions. And if not, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you, um, Dr. Fordall, for your talk. And we're clapping right now on Zoom, <laughs> the way we do things now on a virtually. Um, thank you so much. Please stay in touch. And I wish everyone a wonderful week. Perfect.